evening, everybody, and welcome to the Institute for Government. Uh, I'm Jill Rutter. I am the director of our program on better policy making. And as part of that better policy making program, we're very interested in what we call big thinkers, people with new and interesting ideas, shaping the political landscape. So we're absolutely delighted that in partnership with Policy Network, we have Professor Jacob Hacker from Yale to come and talk to us and explain the mysteries or otherwise of pre-distribution. Uh, just one or two unusual house rules for those of you who know the usual casual and relaxed atmosphere here. This is being recorded for analysis. That's why we're absolutely delighted to have Edward Sturton from the BBC acting as chair. It's also why we have vast amounts of equipment. What that means is, once you've heard very briefly from me, as briefly from Roger Little from Policy Network, we are then going to shut the doors. If you are this side of the door, you are then committed until about 7.15 when Ed calls and ends the process is to stay with us. If you're on the other side of the door, fine. You're stuck on the other side of the door. That's okay. So if you need to make an early exit, you might want to rearrange yourself into the other room now. Uh, but anyway, but absolute delight to have you here. If you haven't been to Institute for Government before, uh, want to come again, make sure that we have your contact details. That's a brief ad for the Institute for Government. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Roger. Or not. Sure. Um, well, welcome everyone. It's Roger Little here from Policy Network. Um, it's a great pleasure to be doing this uh, with the Institute for Government. Um, uh, Jill, it's a great pleasure to uh, share a platform with you. It's also a great pleasure to be doing, uh, to, to be working with one of my oldest friends, Peter Riddle, uh, the Institute's director, uh, in a new context. And uh, what a great context and a success the Institute's been. Uh, secondly, it's uh, fantastic to have uh, Jacob Hacker from Yale uh, in London. Um, uh, we first came across each other when you came to, uh, uh, to Oslo. Uh, and uh, this uh, American academic made a presentation uh, which to this, the progressives there met uh, and uh, made a huge impact uh, on them. Uh, and uh, uh, the Ed Miliband decided to popularize the concept of, of pre-distribution, uh, for which he was then uh, somewhat uh, 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 ridiculed by the Prime Minister and uh, uh, by a man called Professor Hacker. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but nonetheless, the concept is a very, very uh, powerful and interesting one. Um, we've had a report today from the IFS uh, showing that real incomes are going through their greatest ever period of squeeze uh, in Britain. Uh, the question uh, is, what does the concept of pre-distribution uh, have uh, to deal with that situation? And what kind of policies can address it? And if this is a big structural change in the British economy, making us more like America, then I think all our political parties uh, have to find uh, a response uh, to the problems of the squeezed middle uh, and, in the, and, and think through uh, how, if at all, uh, an active state uh, can help change uh, the distribution uh, of income uh, before redistribution. So that's why this is such an important uh, discussion uh, and it's a great pleasure uh, for Policy Network to have helped bring it about. Thank you. Roger, thank you very much indeed. Um, usually, doing a radio interview is a rather sort of intimate business. You do it in the privacy of the studio. Uh, and although you know the audience is out there, you're not particularly aware of them. So doing it in front of you lot is a bit like I don't know, having a bath on the plinth in Trafalgar Square or something. <laughs> it's, a, it's a slightly stilted process. And it works much better if we have a strong sense of your presence in the room. So I will be asking you to contribute questions, and, and please do. But also, while we're talking, if you feel, you know, moved to laugh, cry, whatever, and it's not a football match, but um, do feel free to, to, to make your presence uh, felt as, as we talk. Uh, not with mobile phones, obviously, if you wouldn't mind turning those off. I'm sure most of you have done that <coughs> anyway. A um, couple of other sort of service notes. Uh, we'll take about an hour, I imagine, to record. At the end, it's just possible, no, it's quite likely that uh, Jane or Innes in the front will tell me I've completely forgotten to ask some absolutely crucial questions. So... Um, they'll ask 
to do something again or me to record an extra bit that we that I've buffed or something of that, that kind. I'm going to ask you questions in sort of three lumps, really. A couple of areas where I'd be grateful if you could pick up on the sort of conversation that we've just been having. And then towards the end, I'll give you a more general opportunity to ask questions about whatever you like and, uh, you know, cover things that perhaps I've, I, I haven't covered at all. Uh, if this was a live broadcast, I'd have a thing that enabled the producer to talk into my ear. This is rather more relaxed. If you see that the Jane or this shoving bits of paper at me, don't worry. It's not, uh, it's <coughs> not nothing sinister. It's just that they think that I should um, cover a particular area. And I think that pretty much covers everything that, um, that I need to say. I'm going to, like a sort of conductor, ask you to applaud at the front and then sort of stop you, and then we'll kick off and we'll be into the programme. And uh, then I'll ask you to applaud again at the end. How are we doing, team? Are we all right? Oh, I'm in trouble. Should we just say a few more? Yep, I'll be talking about this level. Um, if that sounds all right. I always tell on, on these occasions when we discuss level, and forgive me if some of you have heard me say this before, but there's a famous occasion when a Today producer did the traditional thing, which was to ask the interviewee to say what he'd had for breakfast. And the man looked at him and said, you're interviewing me because I'm on hunger strike. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if that, uh, is that, um, all right, chaps, it is. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the Institute for Government, a think tank which aims to promote fresh thinking on the issues that really matter to government. The Labour's leader, Ed Miliband, has over the past few days or so begun to sketch out in clearer lines the ambitions that his party will lay before us at the next election. And our guest here is credited with some of the fresh thinking behind Labour's new agenda. Professor Jacob Hacker is a political scientist, the director of the Institution for Social and Policy Studies at Yale in the United States. He is a champion of what is known as pre-distribution elegantly described by The Guardian as an unsnappy name for an inspiring idea. Mr Miliband used the term in a speech last autumn, and indeed Professor Hacker has just come hot foot from a meeting with the Labour leader, I, I, I think. I don't know whether you saw him for long enough, but do you have a sense that he's really serious about looking for new thinking in this area? Well, the first thing he said is he apologised if, if he messed up the term for me, um, as if you know, his talking about it would somehow take away from, from, my, you know, from the originality or, or power of the term. I said, you know, that's the most attention I've ever received for any idea I've ever, <laughs> I've ever put out there. You can, you can talk about it as much as you want. Um, I, do, I do have to say that for me, the, the moment that was most surreal was when somebody sent me uh, a link to the footage of the... Um, takedown of me by David Cameron on the on, uh, during the Prime Minister's question uh, time, and um, I didn't get the joke, which is he compared me. He said that the new guru was J of, the, of of Labour leader Miliband was Mr. J Hacker, and everyone laughed riotlessly. Reference to a um, famous television program. I had to look that one up. So, <laughs> but I did take some umbrage because he said. His latest book is The Road to Nowhere. Um, that was a book that I had written over a decade before. My latest book was, is Winner Take All Politics, and I figured if I was going to get ridiculed on the floor of the House of Commons, I might as well get a little bit of book advertisement <laughs> out of it. So, um, so yes, I did have a chance to meet with him briefly, and I do think he's still taken with the, with the idea, yeah, yeah. perhaps a little bit uh, chagrined about the reception to the label. Well, you're in Britain as guest of Policy Network, and our audience here includes... Um, some very heavyweight policy thinkers and a large number of public servants with long experience of government. I'm going to ask all of you as we um, discuss Professor Hacker's arguments to help me test them by putting some questions. We are, of course, having this discussion at a time of austerity, and the argument is sometimes made that it's difficult to see what a party like Labour is for when there's no money around to redistribute the Blair Brown government could afford to be perhaps a bit more relaxed about the super rich and big money paid in the city because all of that generated taxes which could top up the incomes of those at the other end. But, of course, all of that has changed, and I suppose that context makes your critique of redistribution seem quite timely. Well, I would like to think so, but I should say that the idea came actually out of uh, that book that I mentioned before, Winner Take All Politics, that I uh, wrote with my co-author, Paul Pearson. And, and when we were thinking about 
rising inequality in the United States because the United States and Great Britain really stand out. Uh, Canada is, is sort of a close competitor in terms of the just meteoric rise of incomes at the very, very top of the income ladder. And a lot of people say, well, this is all about you know, market distribution. It's not government redistribution. And, um, and when we started to look at the data and, and the evidence and the history, we found that there were an enormous number of ways in which government had shaped the distribution of income, weakening the bargaining power, for example, of ordinary workers while allowing financial deregulation and corporate governance policies to, um, to escalate the incomes at the very top. So our point was simply that there are an, an enormous range of ways that government shapes the distribution of income that don't involve redistribution, but I think it has become, become timely because we're living in such a constrained era, um, one in which the kind of third way maxims, right? Let markets be markets and you know, we can mop up after the fact, no longer seem to be relevant. We cannot, I think center left parties cannot idly sit by while the market produces, it generates more and more unequal rewards because it's so hard politically in an era of constrained governments um, to be able to uh, step in and, and, and really uh, counter those increasingly unequal market rewards. I think another thing that people are very concerned about. Sorry, is be, yeah, yeah, be, of be, course. Because, because they're so extreme, redistribution of a meaningful kind becomes impossible. Well, it's not just that. It's, I think, a political problem as well. So um, if the message is, well, there's, you know, the market is, is, is rewarding those with talent, um, this is about transformation of the economy, skills are being uh, prided by the market. And, but we'll come in and we'll help sort of lift up the bottom, that creates two political problems. One is that it's simply wrong about what's happened at the top, that this is a result, as I've said, of a lot of policies that have actually increased financial instability, um, that have led to a lot of self-dealing at the top. I and mean, we don't have to talk about the LIBOR scandal here to recognize that, um, that the market at the top is, is not a completely free market. It's one in which there are a lot of policies where insider knowledge and short-termism is dominating. The other thing is that um, you, if you're redistributing to try to sort of bring up the bottom, it creates resentment, uh, particularly among the strained middle, right? People who are receiving some public benefits but are not wholly reliant on them. And if you look at why in Britain, um, we, the, why up till the last 10 or 15 years you didn't see the kind of wage stagnation that you do in the United States, it was mostly because the Blair government was pretty good at providing transfers that would make up the difference. But I think that politically that is much harder to do in the long term. I think that you have to figure out ways to both um, reduce the amount of self-dealing uh, and runaway incomes at the top uh, and uh, provide opportunities for and leverage for workers to gain more of a share of the, of the, of the total gains in the middle and the bottom. So are you saying that redistribution as a political philosophy is dead, that its day has gone? No, I mean, redistribution will always be a part of governance, um, progressive governance, um, especially progressive taxation. Um, if you look at, um, at what's happened over the last generation, uh, market inequality has risen so much that even though uh, the, the very well-off are paying a larger share of total taxes in many rich countries, their tax rates, their effective tax rates, have actually gone down. And we know there's a lot of tax avoidance at the very top. So when it comes to progressive taxation, I think absolutely we should make sure that the tax code is, is, is gaining an, uh, a significant amount from those at the very top, the most fortunate. Um, but I think that the strategy of letting markets be markets and then kind of cleaning up afterwards, that that's no longer a tenable progressive strategy because it, it is, and I think maybe something that just, it's sort of implicit in what I've said, but it's very important to emphasize, is that there is very little trust in government today. So redistribution relies heavily on this idea that we're in this together and government is the vehicle for achieving greater solidarity, greater equality. But in an era in which people don't trust government, uh, and in which they feel as if government in some ways has been complicit in the, in the dwindling opportunity and earnings of the middle, uh, you need to get much more aggressive about encouraging uh, a more fair distribution of rewards in the market in the first place. Government should be on the side of workers. Um, government should be supporting them, but it shouldn't just be in this role, uh, if you will, of taxing and providing benefits. And, and just to be clear, that's how you would characterize the Blair-Brown years, is it letting, letting the markets do their thing and then tidying it up afterwards? Certainly in the financial world, that was the case. And there was a philosophy that may not have been expressed, but that was 
you know, any job is basically a good job, but for creating jobs, we can always top off those jobs. We can make sure that, uh, that there's uh, additional public benefits. And let's be clear, those years were years in which poverty came down in Britain. Uh, there were years in which wage, uh, in which total income growth for the middle was actually much better than it's been for, uh, for in recent years. So, and, and it, it certainly is the case today. Um, we just had this really negative uh, IFS report uh, saying that there's been a decline in real wages. It's certainly the case today that the middle is feeling more squeezed than ever. And, and so that, to my mind, that's the challenge to which uh, a center-left party has to respond. How do you give people hope a in an era in which they feel as if government is not on their side, that there isn't a scope for expanded government activity, but at the same time, they don't feel as if they're getting ahead? All right, well, that's the critique of the past and how we've got to where we are. Unpack this idea of pre-distribution. What does it mean? Well, I think operationally, pre-distribution means that you, do, that you, have, to, you have to ask, what, I, what are the central ways in which government can stand on the side of ordinary workers that do not, that do not involve taxing and providing benefits, um, at, at, in particular, redistributive taxation? And I would say that there are three. Um, one, it means getting the macroeconomy right. It means uh, not engaging in premature austerity policies, for example, or uh, letting finance destabilize the overall economy. Uh, we know from both academic research and common sense is that, the f the, that when we're closer to full employment as an economy, and this is the US and UK, we, we tend to get stronger wage growth across the board. It also means making sure that um, even if inequality is growing in the market, it matters less in terms of some vital public services, things like health care, child care, um, the uh, ability to have education throughout one's life, from uh, early childhood interventions to um, uh, retraining and skills training during the lifetime. And finally, it means, and this is the hardest part, it means trying to make sure that in an era in which organized labor is weaker, that labor still has a voice and a place. And whether that's supporting living wage campaigns, whether that means um, providing new opportunities for workers to have a voice outside of unions, whether it means using the contracting power of government to make sure that jobs are decent, right? As we pri if we privatize public services or contract out, uh, and then we say there's, oh, and, and allow all these low-wage jobs to proliferate in and around the public sector, we're making our job much, much harder. So it's about making sure that there are countervailing powers uh, in, uh, in the market and in politics that ensure that the broad middle of citizens have a voice at the table, not just those at the top. And is the objective greater equality, or is it to provide people with adequate living standards. And that, that you, you said that it was possible to have significant inequalities, but still do some of that. Well, I think the, the ultimate objective is to ensure that inc economic gains translate into broad social gains. So part of that is ensuring that, um, that income uh, gains are broadly distributed, which is about equality. But part of it, as I was suggesting, is about um, trying to encourage um, certain kind, make sure that certain kinds of preconditions of living a, a healthy, productive life or having the opportunity to rise up the economic ladder uh, over the course of one's life are available. And so let me just give one example that I think will make this more concrete for people. Over the last generation, as our society has become more unequal, we've seen essentially a privatization of opportunity in the United States. That is, high-income affluent citizens are pouring more and more money into their children from uh, college education to uh, from you know at the end of the process to um, early childhood intervention at the beginning and that means that inequality is becoming self-reproducing in these societies this idea of equality of opportunity rested on there being a kind of basic level of uh, of opportunity for all citizens and so what we've seen over the last generation is that in countries with higher inequality, it looks as if inequality of opportunity has also uh, increased. And so in, in, in the UK context, I think it's much more emphasis um, than hitherto has been uh, uh, offered on early childhood education, um, uh, the broader broadening of the ownership of assets, um, making sure that schools are of high quality. Um, not, not just, it's not just about funding, it's also about making sure that they're effective. So it's really about trying to restore some measure of, of equality of opportunity because it is one thing to have 
a society where there's a gap between rich and poor, it's, um, a, a, and there's a high level of mobility, but another to have a society in which it looks increasingly as if the rich are able to um, have advantages for, the, for themselves and their children, and those who are not in, these, in the pinnacles of the economy uh, are, really, are really shut out. So you are talking about a pre-distribution of opportunity Absolutely. as well as a change Absolutely. in the way... The well, one way to say it is, is a lot of the things that I'm talking about are providing greater, um, better services, greater um, opportunity, uh, greater, better services and greater access to employment in the short term, um, but greater opportunity in the long term. Um, and so the challenge is, I mean, when people start to talk about skills and education, that is a long-term commitment. Right now, um, middle-class citizens in the United States and Britain are hurting, right? And they would like to have greater opportunity for their children, but they also want to make sure that they have um, uh, access to good benefits, that they have wages that are growing with the overall economy. And so waiting the 20 or 30 years for the skills investments in the young to pay off is waiting too long. You need to have measures that are really trying to push up standards and wages um, for middle and lower income citizens today. We talked in a jokey way about your meeting with Ed Miliband, <coughs> but, but in a more serious way, how much of that kind of thinking do you think is now feeding through into the Labour Party, the left, here? Well, I think it's a difficult challenge, right? The, the IMF uh, has moved, if you will, to the left of the Labour Party in their April 2012 World Economic Report. They very harshly criticized um, the austerity policies of Europe, and that includes those of Britain, um, and saying that it was actually a case in which austerity was self-defeating because uh, it was reducing the economy so much that the deficit was actually increasing. And they suggested that for the sh in, the, in the very short term that these countries should try to stimulate their economies. Um, and I think that the challenge for, uh, for, for the Labour Party, for the left, is in a context in which it's clear that the public overall uh, is very concerned about public spending and very concerned about taxation. In that context, can you credibly say, look, we want to do something in the short term, whether it's investment in housing, right, public capital investment or infrastructure in the United States, to try to jumpstart the economy. But we're committing ourselves in the long term to, to a, 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 a budget that is responsible, that won't, that will allow us to slowly reduce um, our debt as a share of the economy. I think that's the right policy path, and I would say, based on the speeches last week by Ed Balls and Ed Miliband, that they're leaving a little bit of room there. I don't see how, um, I don't see, just as a political analyst, I don't see how uh, the party um, can offer a credible alternative um, to the, um, the ruling coalition if it doesn't have at least some breathing room on this one issue um, of saying, look, we have a somewhat different macroeconomic strategy, and I think that the short-term strategy should be some measure of investment. Now, thinking more broadly, I think that there's a real struggle taking place um, in my sort of limited understanding of how um, things have played out in the British um, party debates. There's a struggle taking place over how exactly labor can respond to the reality that um, that the um, that there's been a decline in public support for uh, for welfare and for public benefits, um, and I think what Labour uh, is what um, Ed Miliband's speech was trying to do is to say, look, we need to re-emphasize a contributory principle. We should say that people who receive welfare after a period of time should work. There should be some skills investment if you're receiving it while out of the labor force because you're caring for children. So let's re-emphasize that reciprocal commitment um, of ben contributions and benefits. I think that makes sense. At the same time, I think that that is not a viable strategy unless you have a real emphasis on how are we going to improve the number of and quality of jobs. That is, to me, where labor has to go overall. And so the movement is in that direction. What, what I'm trying to say is that a pre-distribution strategy is not just one that will make our economy more fair, but it's one that focuses on making our economy more productive and more innovative over the long term. And that the idea that that's going to occur in the absence of serious public investment, uh, in the absence of some policies that really rebalance the private market, I, I think is fanciful, and that's really been the mistake of the, of the last generation of, of progressives, is they said, the market will figure out how to do this. We know now that that's not true. It requires a partnership between the public and private sectors. What you say raises all sorts of um, 
questions about implementation. Before we talk about those, uh, I get, a, uh, get some comments from the audience on what you've just said. But one, one final question before we do that. Uh, I suspect most people would identify the left and redistribution, the redistributive philosophy quite closely. How big a, a radical or how radical a rethink do you think you are, you are proposing? Are, are you essentially leaving behind the way we've thought about the left for the last 50 years or so? You know, it's interesting because I actually think if you go back to the founding moments of the welfare state in the United States uh, and in Britain, that actually the emphasis was not on redistribution per se. Um, you know, Franklin Roosevelt famously inveighed against the dole. Uh, he believed that the most important public benefits were these contributory benefits, and, he's, and he did so for both political and economic reasons. Economically, he felt that it was very important to have people contribute over their working lives uh, for social insurance. Um, politically, he said, if I put these taxes in, no one's going to ever going to, he said, no damn politician will ever scrap my social security program. And in the early 1980s, when Thatcher scrapped the British Social Security program, uh, Ronald Reagan could not. So R R Roosevelt proved right on that. Or if you go back to Beveridge in, in, in Great Britain, public universal services was really the cornerstone of the Beveridge plan. And I think that that tradition, the idea that public services, if they are efficient and effective, if they're serious public sector reform, um, but done often by the public sector, because the, sec the private sector is not going to provide equality of opportunity. The private sector is not going to provide social care and child care without serious inducement. And often the public sector can do it more efficiently if the public sector is run in a rigorous, efficient fashion. That idea of public services, I think it's at the heart of redistribution. Because again, it's not about everyone is part of this bargain, right? It's not about g taking from some and giving to others. It's about saying, look, there are some aspects of our society, like child care, like health care, over the lifetime that we believe are so important and are so poorly handled by the market acting on its own uh, that, that government should play a vital role in providing those services. Well, for those of you who just joined us, we are at the Institute for Government for a special edition of Assignment, uh, Radio 4's program of ideas, and our guest tonight is Professor Jacob Hacker of Yale University. He's been talking to us about his idea of pre-distribution. I'm going to open this up for a few questions at this stage from the floor. We will, in a moment, turn to the sort of mechanisms that might be used to implement some of these ideas. Um, but any comments on the theory? And I'd like to go first to my colleague, <coughs> Mukul Devichan, because he recently produced or presented a, an assignment program on Labour's search for new ideas. Mukul. Th thanks, Edward. Professor Hacker, uh, on analysis, we've been uh, speaking to leading Labour Party thinkers here who are questioning redistribution but they do it for an additional reason, which is to do with culture uh, as well as I understand it. So the argument there is that the way redistribution happens now has a negative effect on our culture. At, in the worst form, it can create perverse incentives, maybe encourage, for example, idleness. Uh, so I wondered, is your promotion of pre-distribution for cultural reasons as well as simply for economic ones? Well, it's a great question, and I would say, I already acknowledge that one of the reasons that I think this idea has gained credence in the United States and Great Britain, um, certainly in Great Britain, is that there has been declining public support for uh, public benefits. Um, and um, you can see that most notably in benefits that are explicitly talked about as being for the poor. Uh, and one of the interesting aspects of this is that in the United States, our most effective anti-poverty program, the Earned Income Tax Credit, is not actually widely viewed as negative. And why is that? Um, now, one reason is it's hidden in our tax code. Um, and I'm generally not a big fan of doing all these uh, public benefits through the tax code, but we shouldn't forget that the tax code is a huge way in which we distribute benefits. And for example, I would be much more willing to um, to cut the special, t to eliminate the special tax free treatment of pension benefits for the age than I would be to eliminate pension benefits for the age. I think when you do things through the tax code, it tends to help those who have the highest tax um, uh, uh, a rate, so it's it's usually regressive, and also when you do through, through the tax code, it's not very transparent. But the reason the earned earn income tax credit is popular is also that it is a subsidy for work, right? You only receive it if you are working, and so um, so I think that the, this idea of emphasizing work um, a, a is not an old one. Uh, it's at the heart of uh, actually the the or original conceptions of, in, of the New Deal and the Beverage Plan, um, but. 
it's a very difficult one to implement in the current context. So I don't, I don't think that there are a lot of people who are idle because <laughs> they somehow have imbibed in a culture of dependency. There are not enough jobs out there, and a lot of the jobs uh, don't pay enough. Uh, it's very difficult for people to balance work and childcare in the current environment. So I think if you look at the world economy right now, you, you, you just can't think that there was sort of a massive culture shock uh, in 2008, 2009, and that suddenly, you know, what is it, two, over two million uh, Britons uh, decided that they wanted to be outside the labor force. It's clearly a failure of macroeconomic policy. So getting the economy back to full employment uh, it seems to me to be essential, but I'm supportive of the idea of having uh, reciprocal obligations, and there seems like one of the ways in which you can m achieve this goal, there's sort of a hard and a, 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 and a soft way to move forward, or a, a tough and a, um, and a supportive way. And I would say the supportive, the tough way would be just cut off benefits. The supportive way is to say, how can we provide people with pathways into uh, longer term em employment? Even if it's, if, if we say that we can't do it, um, that we can't do it because the private sector is, isn't producing enough jobs, then maybe we need to create public sector jobs, at least on a temporary basis, to do vital things for our society. Um, but I think over the long term, it's really about figuring out how to create uh, something closer to full employment in the 21st century economy, and that's been tough for rich countries. Another question, if I can ask you, when I call you to um, uh, say who you are and indeed what you do, that would be a great help for the listeners. Um, yes, sir. <coughs> my name is, is Robert Tabor. I used to be employment editor of the Financial Times. Uh, my question to you is, is really about the role of the state. Um, if what you want to do is, it may be admirable, but it's a bit vague. And I wondered whether the, there has to be a new role for the state in bringing about the changes you want to make. I'm thinking in particular of maybe it's impossible to re-strengthen trade unions or collective mm -hmm. bargaining improve the purchasing power of those in the middle, the squeeze middle, um, or through institutional reforms like works councils or co-determination as the German companies have. Um, but all of this requires a very active role for the state, but we're living in a time, aren't we, when the role of the state is being diminished and we're living through a period when the, the state is being hollowed out and many of the services of the state are going to the private sector. So I can't quite see how we can m move forward in your ideas without changing the role of the state. Well, I don't think we can. I agree with your, your diagnosis. I think what we've learned um, in the last few years is that um, in a complex modern economy, especially one marked by massive flows of capital, um, that the state becomes more important than ever, and it becomes even more important that the state be nimble. Um, and it's a s and but we're living in an era of declining trust in political institutions and uh, an era uh, in which, um, in which we, 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 we put less faith in the ability of the public sector uh, to handle these kind of complex transitions. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenging double movement, if you will. I think the case for the state playing a, a larger role uh, in dealing with a lot of these distributional uh, challenges as well as in figuring out how to produce um, uh, increased prosperity and deal with global challenges like climate change uh, is, is, is undeniable, and at the same time, I think these trends make it harder. Um, that said, um, I mean, there, there is nothing, politically it may be difficult, but there is nothing locked in about the, the, the hollowing out that we're talking about. I think the pressures, the global pressures are ones which that states are grappling with are much harder to think about how to deal with. For example, if one country moves ahead to try to address global warming, uh, and companies are free to move to another, that's a really big challenge. Or one state wants to tax high-income citizens and they go to another country, that's a big challenge. But internally, I think, looking at the internal structure of the state, we have learned that the public sector is um, at least as efficient as the private sector and, and often more efficient in the private sector in a number of core areas. Healthcare, I come from the United States. We have the most private healthcare system in the world. It is also far and away the most expensive. It gets worse health outcomes, spends vastly more. No one would say it's a sign of market triumph, right? Um, likewise, the whole con the, the, there are lots of areas where contracting out has been successful, but if you look at utilities, public utilities, they've had an enviable record. Um, and one of the things that's happened as we've been contracting out and privatizing is that we've, we've not only undermined the state's um, legitimacy and, and trust in it, but we've also undermined, uh, and I think this is absolutely vital, we've also undermined um, the, um, 
the standing of many workers because many of those jobs that were in the public sector were good middle class jobs. So I think that the way forward is you have to move slowly. Someone said that the recipe for, for being a winning politician was do good things, get reelected, repeat, right? The, the recipe for um, rebuilding public trust in the state, it seems to me, is you have to do things that are seen as public. You have to say, the government is going to have a living wage, say, uh, requirement for contracting. People have to see it. It has to be visible. Um, people have to see it in their lives. Um, and the, you know, the NHS is a great example, why? Because the NHS, public trust in the NHS has gone up, way up, um, in the wake of big commitments to trying to make it work. No one, you know, go back to the 1980s in Thatcher, no one believed that you could take the crown jewel out of the crown of the British welfare state because it was effective and it needed, it needed more investment, but it was supported. So the idea is you do good things, right, things that are visible in people's lives, you build trust in the state step by step, um, and it seems to me that that is the recipe that has to be pursued. And you mentioned, I just very quickly, yep. you mentioned work councils. We have to be, and I say we meaning progressives, in general have to be much more creative about in thinking about both organizations in the market and organizations in politics that can represent the broad middle. And so I'll mention two that I think have been uh, sorely neglected. One is, is what, is you, as you said, is or organized representation for labor that is different from but not necessarily an antagonistic to labor union representation. So what about worker representation on the boards of companies? What about work councils? Another that I think gets much less attention, another to crown of value power is investor, consumer, and, e and, and energy consumer um, uh, cooperatives and organizations. So can we organize consumers? Can we get investors to play a more active role vis-a-vis -vis corporate governance? In other words, are there ways in which we can have a more, uh, a broader uh, set of countervailing powers now that labor has play, is playing, can't play that direct, as direct a role as it once did? I'm going to take one more uh, question in this section, gentleman there. Would you mind just making sure that you talk into the top of the microphone? Just hold it a little bit below your uh, oh, yeah. mouth. Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is uh, Daniel ben <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I'm an economics writer. Uh, I'm just not clear what your primary motivation is for pre-distribution. <coughs> because it, it seems to me that you've uh, given quite a few motivations, but I'm not sure, not sure if they're in conflict with each other or okay. if one is more important than another. So as far as I can see, and you may not contradict me or there may be more than this, but you seem to have some notion of fairness. You've certainly said that pre-distribution will lead to, you hope, more innovation and uh, productivity. Uh, you accept that there's some kind of cultural imperative for pre-distribution. You also clearly want to win support for center-left parties, such as the Labour Party or the Democrats, into the US. Uh, are there any more than this? Are these <laughs> in, in, in contradiction with each other? Could you just single out what you think the most important right. thing is? Well, I think the most important is I, I, I wrote a, a short uh, op-ed today um, for The Guardian, and, and the most important point, the title of the piece, was Making the Market Work Again for the Middle. Um, and in the United States, the middle class, I guess, has a somewhat different meaning than it does in Britain. I mean, by that, I really mean the sort of broad uh, uh, sort of middle 60th percent of workers. Um, and the idea that, so the fundamental uh, at the core of pre-distribution is trying to figure out how you can um, have a market that is producing broadly distributed gains. Now in the US, I think that p this has been somewhat less true in Britain, although it's becoming more true. Um, we have seen almost no gain uh, for male workers, essentially no gain. For female workers, a small gain in median wages, even as the productivity of the economy overall has grown. So when people say, well, the economy isn't growing, they mean their wages aren't growing. Um, this divorce between wages, and that includes his wages plus benefits, because of course benefits are a big part of the story in the United States, um, this divorce, I think, is the fundamental problem to which pre-distribution responds. If you continue to have gains going mostly to the top, as we show in our book, Paul Pearson and I show in our book, about 40%, uh, before taxes, more than half of income gains over the last generation went to the top 1%. So if you continue to have a society that's producing so much inequality before taxes and benefits, you're essentially running faster to stay still. Government is having to do more and more redistribution. So that is the fundamental core point. Um, and what is the, uh, you're right that the next point is about innovation and productivity. And here I think the point is very simple, and that is that 
countries that have had higher levels of inequality have not grown faster. So what you're talking about essentially, the case that has been made for gra greater inequality has been, oh look, if we cut taxes at the top, then those benefits will trickle down to the rest. But we have not seen that happen, right? So I'm arguing basically, what are the ways in which we can, through strategies of investment, which are long-term oriented, strategies of, say, regulation or uh, moral suasion, which are more short-term oriented, and macroeconomic strategies, what are the ways in which we can try to increase the degree to which m broad economic gains translate into middle-class economic gains, and how do we increase, on the l over the long term, the, the growth of the economy? And, and I, put, I, I think that is the fundamental <laughs> question. So I think growth remains a primary imperative, growth tempered by the reality of climate change, tempered by the fact that you can have growth uh, that is only going to the top or growth that's not translating into broad social gains. You want growth that translates into broad social gains. That is the fundamental goal uh, to which pre-distribution responds. All right, let's talk a bit more about implementing some of these ideas. You've touched on some of the things you do, but let's explore them in a little more detail. You talked about pre-distributing opportunity and you talked about education. Yes. We've had a comprehensive education system in this country for decades. Almost yep. everyone stays yep. at school till they're 18, 50% go to university. What would be different? We've, been, we've, we've tried that one for some time. Well, first of all, I think it's important to note that in, in the US as well, we have um, a public, e we, we led the world in the, in the, um, in the establishment of public education. Um, there, there are three points. Um, one is that um, what we've learned over the last 20 years or so is that you have to reach, um, you have to reach kids really early. That the most, of the most important period of development for children occurs very early in life. So in the United States in particular, we, we have a very severe problem of, of lack of, u of universal access to pre-K pre education. And that seems to be a vital edu uh, educational investment that needs to be made. The second point is college education, right? So if the college degree is increasingly what a high school degree used to be, the sort of the, the, the entry ticket into the middle class, um, I can say confidently that in the U.S. we're failing to uphold that basic, uh, the, the ability of everyone to have access to that entry ticket. So the, the Britain may be doing better, but what I see in the U.S. and I think we see, we're seeing more and more across the world is that, again, that prerequisite of opportunity is being privatized. More and more the cost of higher education being borne by loans. Um, state universities in the United States are incredibly cash strapped. Uh, and so what we're basically seeing is a, um, a, a stark disparity. The highest scoring students in the United States um, from low-income families are less likely to complete college than the lowest scoring students from high-income families. Um, and so that, to me, is the sort of dangerous path that you want to avoid going down. The last thing, it's not just about spending. It's about the quality of the education, right? And it's distribution within the society. So um, if, you, if kids are going to really poor crappy public schools, um, you're not providing them with quality <laughs> public education. So it's, I think there's a really important point here, which is that a pre-distribution agenda, one that says, we're gonna, try not, we're gonna try to get things right at the input level and also create some bargaining power so that workers are getting more. Um, that, that puts a heavy onus on, as one of the questioners uh, suggested, on having the state run efficiently and effectively. And there is no excuse for poor public services. But I'm, tr I'm trying to get a sense of what would be different in your world. I mean, all those things you've said, you know, not, not having bad s failing schools, every political party would sign up to that in this country. Well, then that's the world over, I would imagine. That's for sure. But, but I don't think that you've got to do all, you, all the things you're saying without spending money ah, because we're. Ah. Well, in I don't austerity. think I've said that you don't want to spend money. I said that I have said that you don't want to spend, that you overall after an initial uh, inve substantial investment to get the economy moving again, that and perhaps some increase in the overall size of the state, but that's a, you know, at a, a steady state going forward, uh, that you have to figure out how to reorder public priorities. But in some areas, yes, you would want to spend more money, and I would certainly invest more uh, in er early stages uh, of people's lives. Um, I would invest more in early childhood education. And I can tell you from the American experience, and I think from what I've learned uh, in my time studying <laughs> the British experience, that investments in early childhood education are still well below what they would be needed to both uh, create uh, a, 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 a society in which people are capable of responding to a dynamic, technologically innovative world, and one that has a quality of opportunity. You mentioned briefly 
pre-distribution of assets. Yes. And there is a school of thought that says if you're really serious about pre-distribution, what you actually mean is aggressive taxation of wealth. Yes. Do you? Well, I think, y you know, I do think taxation of wealth uh, could be part of it, but it's what you do with the, the, re the receipts that matters. I mean, to me... Well, a lot of people said ta the taxing that matters as well, politically. You know, t I mean, I think ultimately the, the, the point I said earlier about uh, progressivity of taxation holds, and I think that in a world in which people at the very top have more and more control over the form that their, t that their income comes in. So it used to be that you could tax labor income um, and you would be getting most of the, of the, the, you would be touching most of people's compensation. Increasingly, people at the top ha are, are receiving their income in the form of capital gains. In the United States, we tax capital gains at a much lower rate than labor income, and that should end. Um, when you talk about taxing uh, wealth, I mean, some countries have very small wealth taxes, uh, and those, it seems to me, have worked relatively well. But to me, what's really crucial is if you have any form of tax, um, it should be progressive. It should go all the way up the income ladder. People who are super rich should pay a higher effective tax rate than people who are, who are merely well-to-do. But crucial is what you do with it, right? And so reducing inequality is not the end in itself. The end of this taxation is providing the funding for, for, effective, uh, for effective public services. And to me, the point about redistributing assets was just this, that one of the things that, um, that uh, the public sector could do was encourage the development of assets for, for less advantaged citizens. Um, and the numbers are truly staggering. In the United States in particular, with the fall in housing values, um, you know, we've seen a massive decline in the assets of the middle class. African American households, uh, black households, have uh, essentially now zero. The typical black family has zero uh, net worth. Um, and so what we're, we're so this is a problem we know from tons of research that not having basic assets means not being able to start businesses, not feeling the freedom to be able to, t to change jobs. So I think that this, you know, this was something that was actually eliminated the day that the, <coughs> the coalition government came into power. They got rid of the baby bonds. Um, and, you know, I do think this, this idea of providing people with assets was once a kind of left-right uh, agreement. And I think what's politically difficult about it is it requires making long-term investments in people. And so we have a tendency as societies to eat our seed corn. And uh, the minute there is a fiscal reversal, uh, if we've invested in, in these bonds or invested in some other area, we have a tendency to want to just suddenly use that for other purposes. But I do think that if we are going to be serious about remedying inequality of opportunity, we're going to have to think about assets like housing uh, and educational um, savings and the like, as well as income. You also talked about living wage. You know the argument against that, which is that in a globalized world, that's just not possible. It damages economic efficiency. What's your, uh, your uh, answer to that? Well, there are two things to say. One is that the research on the minimum wage has come to the conclusion that modest increases in the minimum wage, certainly in the American context, have very little in the way of negative employment effects. Um, and our wages are are meaning any rich country's wages are m already massively higher than the wages in other countries. Um, so we're not competing with these countries because we have lower, uh, higher, uh, because of our, we can go bring our wages down. We're competing because we're so much more productive. And to be productive in the future, we have to invest in skills. We have to invest in technology. The last point, though, and perhaps the most important point, is that the areas where the living wages uh, and contracting uh, requirements that would bring up wages and benefits matter most are the least traded sectors of our economy. Um, you are not going to outsource uh, the janitors um, who are cleaning up the, in the hospitals. Um, they need to be there, right? So in a global economy, uh, th those are precisely the jobs that should pay a decent minimum, and we should be willing as a society to pay a little bit more for those services so that the people who are providing, um, providing them uh, can have uh, a decent standard of living. So to me, that's, you know, within a reasonable bound, I don't think that, that, um, that, that the, the globalization constraint is really the problem. Got to open up this to more questions in a moment, but just, just sorry, <laughs> being greedy, one more for, <laughs> from me. Um, you talked in answer to one of the earlier questions about new ways of collective action, new ways of yeah. organizing people to put pressure on companies yeah. and, and so forth. What's to suggest that that can work when all the experience of the past is that it hasn't really in this country. I mean, the unions did extraordinary things and then 
um, were very badly tarnished by what happened here in the 1970s. Shareholder democracy doesn't seem to have controlled some of the excesses in boardrooms. Why do you think you can make that work? Well, I mean, I think if you look over the long span of history, we've had periods of massive mobilization of citizens through social movements, uh, through new political parties and social organizations. I think back to the U.S. progressive era, right, which is really the period in which we saw most of the reforms that we understand to be constituent, uh, con con you know, to constitute the aspects of a decent society, um, the granting of the right of, to, of women to vote, for example, the creation of national uh, of, of state minimum wages, and so on. When you go back to that era, you saw massive mobilization. So, I be and, and we're also in an era in which the costs of, of of organization of social mobilization have gone dramatically down because of technology. Um, so I don't actually I don't actually think it's uh, it's unrealistic, but we have not been very creative in thinking about the form. Um, that it might take. And so I mentioned one possibility that I think should be thought more, that should be taken more seriously. There are nonprofit organizations and foundations in the US and in Great Britain who are investing enormous sums in trying to, to, to deal with acute poverty and hardship, to try to improve education with standards and the like. Um, there are, there's almost no investment in creating new kinds of collective political organization. Um, unless we're gonna give up on the idea uh, uh, that, that there is, there are s ties that bind us that are stronger than our, our link to each other as consumers uh, or as you know, occasional spectators at sporting events. We have to try to deepen and broaden civil society again. And, I, and the challenge is great, but we've done it in the past. And, and I mean, there were questions out here in our conversation earlier today. It was clear that there are actually a lot of creative ideas out there for how you can get workers organized in new ways. Um, so. We are in a post-labor society in the sense that in labor unions have lost enormous ground and if we're, they're going to be rebuilt, they're going to be rebuilt slowly, it's going to take a long time. But we, I hope, are not in a, in a, in a post-civil society where there are um, both public and private organizations that link us together and allow us to solve problems together. Because the alternative, right, is that there's only, there's only, there's, there's the Scylla and Charybdis of the state and the market, right? Civil society is the glue that makes public-private partnerships work. Uh, and if we don't have that, I, I really fear for the ability for us to navigate the complex challenges we face as a society. Some questions based on what we've just heard. Yes, lady there. Just uh, wait for the microphone if you don't mind. Hi, Faiz Shaheen from the New Economics Foundation. Um, I'm really interested in the idea of pre-distribution. We've been looking at it for some time. And we, we perceive it as being a kind of whole system approach. And like you have a long list of things that need to happen, whether it be banking reform or, or intervention in the housing market, childcare, for instance. I guess, um, drawing on something that was said earlier, uh, the point is, is that the sis to some extent we're going the other way. And um, some of this may be accepted. For instance, childcare, universal childcare system. Yeah. Um, may be uh, accepted and be more politically palatable. I wonder if there's a problem here about the pre-distribution idea being watered down, and do we, does it really require a kind of big bang of policies? And just related to that is how this overlays on top of those wealth inequalities that we've just, mm. we've just spoken about. So is there, again, is there some, a sequencing issue here about the need to redistribute? Some would argue that the reason that education, education, that mantra and that investment hasn't worked till now is because um, actually, the wealth inequalities were so high, you know, you pay 30 grand a year to go to Eton and it's five grand a year at state school. So you need to do something about redistribution potentially before you can do something about equality of opportunity. Well, I mean, I think the, the, the fact is, is that any strategy for reform, is there is no magic bullet, right? And so one of the frustrating aspects of redistribution to, um, to some is that when I talk about it, there are several different elements. I've stressed three, right? I've stressed getting the macroeconomy right. I've stressed quality public services, and I've stressed creating greater countervailing power. But of course, beneath those, as you were suggesting, there are a whole host of different policy interventions. And, and I actually think one of the strengths of it as an organizing framework for thinking about these issues is that um, is it, is it, a can, it, it can create kind of creative thinking about, okay, well, if we're worried about whether low-wage workers have bargaining power, what are the different ways we could approach it? We could have, for example, some kind of minimum wage, or we could figure out ways to empower workers, or we could try to attach requirements to con public contracts, and so on. So, but you, you, you're absolutely right to say that there's no sign in the present political environment here or in the United States um, of a kind of groundswell of public support 
for, for a much, much more active state. And that's why I said sort of the strategy had to be do good things, not maybe starting small, uh, uh, rinse, repeat, right? Um, and, um, and, and, and you're, you're rightly asking the question, well, first of all, do we have to do major redistribution before any of that is possible? I'd say, well, maybe, but that's not in the cards, right? So, um, so I'm, I'm living in the world as it is, not the world as I, would, uh, I might like it to be. The second question you asked is whether we, we, we have to have a big bang, whether you have to do it a, 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 a with some substantial changes out front. And I think the answer to that is, is a qualified um, no. Um, the qualified part is that I think it's absolutely imperative that, um, that there be a shift in the macroeconomic approach uh, in the U.S. and in Great Britain, but certainly in Great Britain, which has followed a <laughs> much more penurious, austerity-driven policy. Um, it is killing the British economy, I believe. And uh, I, I'm, as I said, I'm on, I'm on pretty solid ground here because the IMF agrees with me, not just Paul Krugman. Um, there is actually, I think, a pretty broad consensus among those who've looked at the numbers, and you know, Martin Wolf is writing a column a day on this now at this point. Um, there's a pretty broad consensus that there really should have been some short-term stimulus in the past, uh, and, and, and um, whether or not in two years that'll still be the case, I don't know, but I put a pretty heavy bet that this would be a good idea. So that's one element of a, of, uh, that has to happen. And the other thing that has to happen is serious effort to reform finance. In the U.S., there has been some, but I think it was, it was much more half-hearted than... Those are the big bangs I think we need. But on this broader agenda, so getting the public services right, <coughs> investing in pre-K education, I think it can be done more incrementally. Again, it has to be done in a way where we're saying, look, we, we're not growing the state uh, overall. Uh, we're making the state smarter. Uh, in what it does. After this initial investment, which I think is the only way to, um, to right the economy in the short to medium term, after this initial investment, the idea is to basically, um, to basically rethink uh, public priorities in a way along the lines of what I've been talking about. And I think that could happen in a more incremental fashion. Question right at the back. Yes. Um. Thank you. Uh, Hugh Lloyd, uh, systems practitioner and policy implementer. Uh, four, four devices that I'd love your sort of feedback or thoughts on. Um, the first one, we spend over £20 billion on housing benefit in this country. Uh, that could be worth three or four pence off income tax. Would you think that as a useful pre-distributive move? Um, Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple last week, he talked about uh, the inequity of the income, t uh, the tax treatment of companies vis-a-vis -vis individuals. Individuals get get taxed on their income, companies get taxed on their net profit. Actually, they should both be taxed in the same way. Uh, a third one, uh, I've read and heard but never found the evidence that in 1973, in the three-day week, uh, that's possibly the most productive time in British industry. <laughs> uh, and I wonder whether there's a, a pre-distributive device that's about the calendar, yeah. and how time is or isn't spent and public holidays, school okay. holidays, things like that. And then the very last one, um, if every primary school in Britain had uh, a sort of predetermined place at Oxbridge and the other big institutions of higher education in Britain, would that be another pre-distributive device that would be useful? You don't Thank have you. to answer all of those. You can I couldn't if I wanted to, but I appreciate the ideas. So let me just say on the housing benefits, because this is something that's been talked about a bit this morning. I have to say, I think that um, I came to the view that if there was an area that was crying out for public capital investment in, in Britain, it was, it was housing. And that um, one of the sort of strange features of the current policy is that there's huge amounts being spent on, the hou on housing, right? But it's not, actually, um, it's not actually providing people with equity, right? And so, uh, so uh, I, I, would, I would argue for rather than subsidizing pri private, private housing uh, alone, that there should be a combined strategy with a much greater emphasis on public investment. Um, the three-day week question, which is sort of, I know you, ask, you sort of asked in jest, but you know, there was a famous essay by Keynes where he suggested that by this time we would all be working you know, 15 hours a week because of productivity increases. And in, in the U.S., this is a particularly acute observation, right? Because uh, if you count the increased work hours of women, we, we, have, we are the country that has seen the biggest overall increase, uh, or at least we've remained 
high in terms of overall work hours, while many people, many countries seem to have taken their increased productivity in the form of more leisure time. Um, more recently, it's been forced leisure, but historically, it's been about um, it's been about um, it's been about uh, reducing the number of wor work hours as, as incomes go up. Um, and the, the, the one idea that I think fits in here quite well is that the German success with work sharing is something that I think has received much less attention than it should. Uh, in the US case, we actually have provisions under many state <coughs> unemployment insurance programs that would allow work sharing. And yet there's so, there was so little um, attention to this idea that it has not been implemented, it was never implemented. And it seems to me a tragedy when you have someone who's completely out of work when there's a context in, in a context in which you actually could have kept people on the job for more limited periods of time. I think going forward, especially if, as we try to keep more older people in the workforce, thinking about kind of ways to encourage flexibility in the labor force, right? Flexibility in the labor force has been a kind of code word historically, right? For, you know, let's pay workers very little and give them little job security. But I actually think the idea that workers are going to have much more unconventional career patterns as more older workers are, are moving into the workforce, or as we're experiencing periods like periods we're experiencing today where there's actually a shortage of jobs, um, I think that the flexibility of that, uh, thinking creatively about flexibility there could be part of a pre-distribution strategy. Another question. Um, let's have a look. It's difficult to choose. Why don't we get, you look very eager, sir. I'm Steve Hart. I'm from uh, CLASS, the trade union-based think tank. Uh, when I read Winner Takes All Politics, uh, which reads like a thriller, uh, and it's about the, the redistribution of power and wealth over the last 30 years, one of the key points you made uh, is that labor unions, labor unions were pushed under the, uh, under the train, that yep. labor unions didn't fall. Don't we need to look at... Don't we need to look at how we can restore uh, the rights of labor unions, whether it's in the US or Britain, as well as the very interesting points that you made tonight about worker empowerment? Don't we also need to create a new legal, political, uh, and institutional framework that promotes collective bargaining and labor unions, perhaps looking in particular uh, at Germany and the successes there? Yeah. Well, the, the short answer is yes. And so when I said that I think that the v best we can hope for was you know, was was inc slow gains. Uh, that that would be a very hopeful scenario given our recent history. So let me just say a word about American labor because um, uh, as much as the standing of labor unions has fallen in Britain, it's worth it's worth looking at <laughs> at an even more um, an even more uh, cautionary tale. Um, in, in the US now, private sector labor unions are so limited that they're probably, we're probably overstating their, their, their role in the private sector by two or three percentage points. So right now, the number, the official number is in the five to seven percent range. But because when you have essentially 95 percent of people not in private sector workers, not in labor unions, and, those, and, and the error rate in their reporting, right, and it all falls on the side of people who aren't in labor unions, uh, is high. So there's lots of that 95% who say, oh yeah, I'm a member of a labor union, and they're not, right? There's only 5% of people in labor unions who could, who could be wrong. Um, and so the point is that we're probably overstating labor union presentation in the United States. So why do I make that point? Because I actually look at another country. You look at Germany. I look at Canada. Canada is one of the few countries that, it's, that has seen a relative stability. And it's not, by the way, because of public sector unions. So if you look at why Canada has held up well, it's because Canada has a number of provisions that, um, that, we, that, that Amer American labor unions have been seeking. Um, card check certification, for example, that allows uh, the, and, and much shorter election periods. I think the problem in the US right now is that the system is so broken Right, that the only way that you're going to fix it is essentially replace it, but th in the current political context, that's impossible. In the, in the British context, I think there's probably greater reason for hope. My point is that you're not going to get labor unions coming back if the rest of American workers, uh, or rest of British workers, don't feel as if they have a stake in what they're doing. And so I think the best way for labor to get, uh, to, to put itself in a stronger position is to invest in broader worker empowerment. Um, both because this creates greater credibility and support for labor unions, and because um, it's going to be the precondition for getting the political support for the changes down the line. Final question here at the front. Uh, Jill Rutter, Institute for Government. Um, I just wanted to ask you how pre-distribution would play out, say, in a bank. 
So you have a bank where increasing share of income has gone to you know, a elite cadre of workers, but actually what difference does pre-distribution make? Uh, they don't actually employ many of these lower paid workers that you're worried about. So what happens? Well, first of all, I think that this is a huge, you're, Jill, you're really highlighting a, a feature of the present economy in the U.S. and, and Britain that, um, that makes pre-distribution more necessary, and that is the decentering of corporations. The fact that they're increasingly, right, if you look at a company like Apple, right, m very little of, of its workforce is in the United States, and, and the, those it employs in the U.S. are, with the exception of those who work in the Apple stores, are, are pretty well treated, right, but most of its workforce is, is around the world. And, and I think that in that context, right, it actually calls on us to, l to focus less on individual economic organizations, which was kind of the old strategy of pre-distribution, can we kind of, uh, the sort of Fordist approach, and to focus much more on how, how are the incentives uh, at the top aligned so that you're getting companies that are, there isn't a lot of self-dealing, there's real checks and balances for corporate heads, right? Especially when the, the la there's not labor unions that playing that role. So that's why I talked about empowerment of shareholders, investor collectives, and the like. And with regard to ordinary workers who are no longer really tied into that same um, organization, you have to focus on them directly, which is where the pre-distribution strategy of trying to increase worker empowerment, uh, using the contracting power of government, focusing more on public services than we have, uh, raising minimum standards, where that kicks in. So in a way, right, there's no, I mean, maybe another way to point this, put this is that I think there has been a sort of facile belief among many progressives if, if, is that if we can figure out a way to reduce the rewards at the very top, that will naturally go to the middle. It's sort of the reverse trickle down theory, right? So the, it, the conservatives said, well, if we cut taxes on the rich, right, those gains will trickle down to the middle. A and now I think there are many liberals who would say, you know, if we can just figure out a way that the very top corporate folks aren't paid as much, right, that then middle class workers will receive more. I don't think there's anything automatic about it. It's, a politi it's politically mediated how that plays out and mediated through the organizations that represent workers. So you have to focus on both sides of the equation. The reason I'm worried about pay at the top is not because I resent that there are people who are making millions and millions of dollars, but because it is distorting our overall economy. The kind of financial crises we face are a direct result of a hands-off policy towards finance and a broken corporate governance system. The reason I'm worried about the middle is not because there's, it's inevitable that when people do well, that those in the middle do badly. It's because middle class workers aren't receiving a fair share of the gains of growth. And that fair share is something that's determined both by our economy and by our society. And, and so we have to step back, I think, and ask this sort of fundamental question. What kind of society do you want to live in? Do we want to live in a society in which the very well off are cosmopolitans who can jet from one place to another, um, whereas more and more middle class workers are constrained, squeezed, worried, disenchanted, frustrated, uh, zeroed out, you know, uh, uh, zoned out of democratic politics, spectators in the game of democracy that's increasingly played out with big dollars and, and broken political institutions. That's not the world that I think most Britons want to live in. It's not the world that most Americans want to live in. It's not the world I want to live in. And it's not the world that pre-distribution would, would, would create. Pre-distribution would really focus on creating a much fairer society before government even steps in. That is probably a very good note to end it on. I'm sorry we've run out of time. There's a forest of hands up, and I, my apologies to those of you who weren't able to ask your questions. Um, our thanks to our host, the Institute for Government, and my thanks to all of you who did ask questions, because they were very pertinent ones. Um, but above all, thank you to our guest, Professor Jacob Hacker, Director of the Institution for Social and Policy Studies at Yale. Thank you. Thank you. Do you, mind, do you mind holding on for two seconds? Because I did fluff a couple of things, in, including the second sentence, which wasn't so good. So I'll just read out a couple of things again, if I may. Um, may right. I thank yes? you for oh, an well, excellent interview? Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. oh, well, thank you. It was great. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was great. It was great stuff. Very good stuff. And all the mistakes were mine. Um, let me read this out. I'm sure that's not true, but you, true. all the mistakes to get corrected are yours. So that's <laughs> <laughs> mine are going to be broadcast. <laughs> um, Welcome to the Institute for Government, the think tank which aims to promote fresh thinking on the issues that really matter for government. Labour's leader Ed Miliband has, over the past few ten days or so, 
began to sketch out in clearer lines the ambitions that his party will lay before us at the next election. And our guest here is credited with some of the fresh thinking behind Labour's new agenda. And then it's the ident. The ident and the introduction to Muckle. Okay, very good. For those of you who just joined us, we are at the Institute for Government for a special edition of Analysis, Radio 4's programme of ideas. And our guest tonight is Professor Jacob Hacker of Yale University, who's been talking to us about pre-distribution. I'd like to take uh, our first question from one of my colleagues, Mukul Devachand, who recently presented a special edition of analysis on the subject of labor search for new ideas. Mukul. The what? There's a howl on what, so we need the questioner to... Yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's your question. My question, which one? Not my fault, then. Is the objective of achieving the quality or, 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 or adequate? Yeah. You don't have to answer this, but apparently the air conditioning came on while I was asking it. I it might have to get the air conditioning <laughs> back on. <laughs> <laughs> if we can just be, this is, I think this is the last one, so if you can just bear, bear with me and, and sound wrapped, if that's possible to do. Is the objective of all this equality, or is it simply to raise people's standards of living to an adequate level? 